Hi there. I'm Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine. My years in the shop, I've seen many cars come in that experience dead batteries or, or bad batteries. The problem is many technicians fail to get to the root cause of why that battery let them down. Join me in this episode of The Trainer and find out how to improve your accuracy and efficiency with battery and charging system diagnostics. Every vehicle uses a battery, and that battery serves a couple of purposes. It has to store energy and provide that energy to operate the starter, probably the heaviest load the vehicle is ever going to see. But again, that battery has to store energy in order to provide that energy for that starter. The alternator is the battery's heart of the charging system, and that alternator has to produce electrical potential to not only feed that battery and replenish it, but also supply the rest of the vehicle current so our creature comforts continue to work along with our computers and the systems that they govern. Over time, batteries begin to age and in a chemical process known as sulfation, internal to the battery voltage drops occur. You could look at it as the battery being a storage tank, much like our fuel tanks. Even if the battery is at full charge, almost like having a full gas tank. Imagine taking that 20 gallon gas tank and shrinking it over time. Even if you filled up a two gallon gas tank, it would only get you so far. The same holds true with a battery. Lead and acid come together in the battery to create a chemical reaction to produce electrical potential or voltage. And as that sulfation takes place, that process can't happen as efficiently. So over time, the battery begins to cause the charging system to suffer. The alternator, the device designed to replenish the battery, operates off of a duty cycle, meaning the computer governing its operation turns on its field circuit and turns it off, turns it on and turns it off, typically somewhere around a 50% duty cycle meaning it spends half its time on and charging, and the other half it spends off. The importance of that off time is significant to the longevity of the alternator's operation. Manufacturers build alternators to make them capable of outputting far more than the vehicle requires, typically twice that of the vehicle's requirements. And it's for that reason we can operate the alternator at a 50% duty cycle, again, half on and half off. The significance of the time off allows the alternator's electronics to cool down. As an alternator produces output to replenish the battery, when the battery begins to take on a charge, its internal resistance begins to go up. As a result, current flow through the battery over time starts to go down as the alternator charges the battery and that battery takes on charge. When sulfation occurs, that prevents the battery from taking on a charge. And as a result, its internal resistance does not go up, meaning charge current going through the battery remains relatively high. Why is that a problem? because that 50% duty cycle, the on and off time of the alternator, that off time that was allowing the alternator to cool down is no longer there. The duty cycle has to increase, maybe somewhere around 75 or 80% duty cycle. Meaning, instead of having half the time to cool off, it only has a fraction of that. And I promise, you likely have seen this in the shop several times. A vehicle has come in, it had a battery replaced and an alternator replaced. The vehicle comes back six months later and the alternator has failed once again. However, there's nothing wrong with the battery. We try a replacement alternator, it fails several months later. We even go with a different brand alternator. And again, the same thing keeps happening. The underlying fault is a voltage drop, likely somewhere in the charging system loop preventing the battery from taking on a full charge and preventing the battery 
from increasing its return or resistance. Again, as a result, the alternator continues to have a ch high charging system duty cycle and the problem continues over time. I want to demonstrate to you some really cool techniques that you can apply to any vehicle you're working on with a simple lab scope. Today we're going to be featuring the Automotive Test Solutions eScope Elite 4. I'm going to be utilizing only two channels of this scope. One, to monitor voltage drop across the battery and two, to monitor charging current through the battery. What we are hoping to see is when the vehicle is started, a tremendous amount of current is going to leave the battery to feed the starter. And then after the engine starts and I release the key and the alternator begins to charge, you will see a high amount of current head back into the battery. But you'll also see over time, if the battery's healthy, can take on a charge and increase its internal resistance, the charge current through that battery should diminish to less than five amps in two to three minutes. When we have a faulty battery or a voltage drop somewhere in the charging system loop, again, that battery does not take on that charge, does not increase its internal resistance, and as a result, the charge current through the battery is going to remain high far more than five minutes. This is how we locate problems pertaining to premature alternator failures or repeat alternator failures. As mentioned earlier, we're only going to be using two channels on our Automotive Test Solutions eScope Elite 4. They're going to connect to the scope module, and the scope module is going to connect to the PC via USB cable. We are going to be attaching on one channel a voltage lead across the battery terminals. And on a second channel, we're going to be implementing this amp probe. The size of the jaws are significant because they can accommodate the battery positive cable leaving the battery and reaching the alternator. We're going to connect these to the vehicle, start the vehicle, and capture the data. Like most digital storage oscilloscopes of today, this Automotive Test Solutions eScope Elite 4 has provisions to accommodate an amp probe, meaning we can select the amp probe we are using and it will do the math for us and plot a trace or a graph in amperage. However, I'm going to demonstrate another technique today. I'm deliberately using an amp probe that was not designed to work with this scope. Now it's not to say that the amp probe doesn't work, it works just fine, and the scope works just fine. I just mean the math, the conversion of voltage output from the amp probe to actual amperage is not available for this probe. But on the probe it is documented that for every one amp of current flow that passes through these jaws, the probe is going to output 10 millivolts. So we have to keep that math in mind when we evaluate our amperage on our digital storage oscilloscope meter function. We have to keep in mind the conversion of 10 millivolts for every amp. Quite simply, we're going to take one channel of the scope and connect it at the battery positive cable and reference the ground to the ground lead of the battery cable. On a second channel, we are going to implement an amp probe and it's important that the amp probe goes around both the wire coming from the alternator to the battery and the wire leaving the battery feeding the fuse block. This will allow our scope to automatically cancel out the current flow for the rest of the vehicle and leave only the current flow through the charge circuit of the battery. Just like so. So I've deliberately got the scope set up in a meter mode so we can watch the values on the right. The values in red represent battery voltage drop across the battery terminals and the yellow represents input from our amp probe placed around the positive cable to eliminate the entire circuit and only leave current flow through the charge circuit of the battery. Let's start the car and see what happens. I'm going to be implementing a timer once I start the car to show how much a lap time has gone by. I've started the timer and we can expect two to three minutes to be under five amps. Now again, if you do the math, 10 millivolts represents one amp of current. 
So if we have 100 millivolts, it represents 10 amps of current. We are already down to about 50, 50 millivolts, which indicates 5 amps of current, and it's dropping, and only 40 seconds has elapsed. This is indeed a healthy battery, a healthy alternator, and a healthy charging system circuit. So what I'd like to do now is break down my, my process here so we understand we're all on the same page of what's actually going on here. When a vehicle's engine is running and the alternator is producing output, it has the highest voltage potential of anywhere in that charging system circuit. So as this alternator produces output, we might see something around 105 amps leaving the alternator. That 105 amps, it's going to make its way from the battery positive towards the battery negative because the potential from the alternator is a lot higher than that of the battery, at least by two volts or more. So current is going to flow in this direction. The majority of the current is going to turn right back around and make its way to the fuse box or boxes and provide current flow for the rest of the accessories and computers on the vehicle. Of course, that current flow is going to make its way through the vehicle to ground potential where the alternator is referenced to complete that circuit. However, on a parallel circuit here, that same 105 amps that went through here and turned around, again, only 100 amps went back to the battery, meaning the other 5 amps leaving the alternator was making its way through this battery, charging it up, filling it up with electrons, if you will, and making its way back to the alternator on the ground path here. Now, this drawing is going to represent what a healthy battery charge loop looks like. Next, I'll show you what happens when we introduce a fault. In this depiction of a fault, I've introduced what you see here indicated by a yellow star. We could use this to represent green corrosion at a battery post, or maybe a loose connection between the battery terminal eyelet and the battery post itself to signify voltage drop, voltage energy being used up across that poor connection. So what happens is the alternator is going to output as it did before, but instead of the battery taking on a charge and its internal resistance not increasing, since the internal resistance remains low, high battery charge current can continue. So this alternator might be able to now output 135 amps as a result, meaning again, 100 amps is feeding the rest of the vehicle through the fuse box, but 35 amps is now representing battery charge current. As a result, the 50% duty cycle that once was allows the alternator time to cool off every time it's in this low state, this low logic state, because the alternator field coil is not producing current. However, since we've got 135 amps now, an additional 35 amps is required to supply the battery charge current loop. And as a result, we have to field the alternator more, increasing its duty cycle from approximately 50% to maybe 75 or 80%. This additional on time takes away from the off time that was allowing the alternator electronics to cool. And this is where diodes and rectifier bridges tend to go bad because of the heat energy built up inside the alternator. It can't dissipate the heat fast enough. You gotta admit, it's a pretty swift way of evaluating a battery and alternator charging system loop. Again, the idea in any diagnosis is to get to the root cause of the fault. Continuing to replace alternator after alternator after alternator is not going to solve the issue. Getting to the root cause of the problem is going to allow you to figure out what is causing the alternator to fail. You can make that repair, save yourself a lot of time, headache and embarrassment, even money in many cases. This automotive test solutions eScope Elite 4, the meter function allowed for quick analysis of this battery without making things too complicated. I'm Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine, and thank you for joining me on this episode of The Trainer. See you next time.